Anyone in that room always calm out? If you turn that down a little bit. All right. Okay. Uh, a little bit less. Okay, that's perfect. I guess. Yeah. Um, well, hope you guys are uh, getting over your Buckeye loss hangover. That's <laughs> kind of yeah. that I, I uh, stopped working on my sermon at one point to catch the fourth quarter to the so close and then. Kind of just in time for a game yeah. ending interception to yeah. end it all. Uh, I know. It's not a good way to end with that head, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, happy Sunday, you guys, and I'm, I'm glad I get to uh, preach. Uh, you guys know I only preach about uh, once a month now, and it's, it's like, like a sweet spot for me. It still seems like it comes upon me very quickly, but it also allows me to have a lot of weekends free, so I really enjoy that too, but uh, I enjoy preaching. Uh, so today I want to start a story that I heard uh, once. I used to attend uh, Vineyard Leadership Institute several years ago, and it was, uh, it's over at the Vineyard Church of Columbus. And uh, the um, one of the classes that I took was on church growth, and it was very uh, I was very eager to take this class because uh, Rich Nathan was going to teach it because obviously the Vineyard Church has grown a lot, so he has some really good insight about how a church grows. And one of the uh, things that he talked about was very interesting. He told us a story. Uh, years ago, I think it was in the uh, mid-90s, maybe late 90s, a uh, vineyard was growing and they decided they needed to build uh, a new building for their church. And if you guys have ever been to that church, it's huge, it's grand, many rooms, it's very large. That was recently built in the 90s. Before that, they had a much smaller uh, chapel. And he said when they began to start this building project, this was a multi-million dollar project, they quickly realized this was a huge project. And someone recommended to Rich that you should properly hire a consultant who can help us through this process of doing this building project. So they hired a consultant. When the consultant arrived at the church, uh, he showed up in a suit, very professional looking. They went into a meeting room, and they sat around and began telling him what their plans were for this church building, how they wanted it, where they wanted things, and, and so on. And this consultant began to take notes. After the meeting, the consultant uh, left. And a couple weeks later, uh, they, in the mail, they received a packet from the consultant uh, detailing his plans for this building project. And as soon as they opened it and began looking at it, it became very clear to them that this consultant was not paying attention to them when they, when they expressed what they wanted in this church building project. He, what he gave them was, in fact, very vanilla, very generic, just something you almost seemed like he download, downloaded off the internet. So they were quite disappointed. They, they tried calling him, they, they realized after a while that they would call him and he wouldn't call back after several days. When they, they would ask for revisions and when he would send them their revisions, it wasn't what they wanted. And uh, eventually they got to a point where they realized, you know what, if we really want to get this building project done, we're going to have to move on without this consultant. So Pastor Richie went in front of the church board and said, hey, uh, I would like to take on the lead for this project. I want to head this myself. And we'll get this done. Do I have your permission? They gave him permission to do so. And so Pastor Rich, while being a senior pastor of the church, um, keeping those duties, he, he became the project manager for this large building project. And so the building was completed. If you've seen it, it's a great building, very large. And, and Pastor Rich managed that whole thing by himself while being a pastor. Sometime after the building was completed, uh, they, they received in the mail a, a, something from the consultant that they previously hired. And in the, in the mail was a bill for $21,000 for his services, for his consulting services. Obviously, they were, they were very uh, shocked and disappointed. And so they got together, the church board and Pastor Rich got into a, a meeting room, called the consultant, put him on speakerphone, and told him, uh, we received your, your bill in the mail for your services, the $21,000. And what I have here in my hand right now is a $21,000 check written and signed to you. But I only have one condition before I give this to you. I want you to come here, stand before us in this room, and tell us how you earn this $21,000. If you do that, we will give you this $21,000. If you could tell us how you earn this money. And I don't know how the rest of the conversation went. I'm sure it was quite awkward. But uh, the story ended with the consultant never showed up for that money. He knew that he had not earned it. And uh, the, the moral of the story that Pastor Rich is telling us is that uh, when you are looking for help with services, a project, or help with anything, you should hire a practitioner, not a consultant. For example, uh, 
You may know a lot about treating a lawn. You may have read all the books about how to get rid of weeds, how to make the grass look green. But if you've never treated a lawn before, I don't want you to treat my lawn because you don't have experience. You could be the best medical student who has the best grades, top of your class, aced all your exams, but I'm not gonna let you give me a prostate exam, for example, unless you've done it multiple times. You know, or if you may have the top of the line, the best million dollar LASIK eye surgery machine, but I'm not gonna be your first patient. I want someone who's done it 10,000 times, who's done it over and over and over again. We like practitioners. You can have a house full of books about diet, nutrition, and working out, but if on the BMI scale, you are considered morbidly obese, it's gonna be hard for me to take your advice when you say, you can overcome uh, your eating habits. You can uh, eat better. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. I think many of us, at least that's how I'm wired, when I want a service or when I want to uh, get help, I, look, I want to use a practitioner rather than a consultant. And the reason I bring this up is, I was thinking about this text we're looking at today, and I thought about this, that, you know, we Christians, we come to church every Sunday, and we listen to a sermon every Sunday. Many of us read, read our Bibles many times throughout the week, or maybe at least once a week. Uh, several of us, if I go into your house, I'll go into your study or your library or whatever, and your, your, your shelves will be lined with Christian books, probably over 100 books that you've probably read. And so many of us Christians have all this knowledge about God, about the Word of God, but so often we fail to be practitioners of what we know. We can debate with the best of them about the difference between having a free will choice and salvation versus irresistible grace, debate the Calvinists, debate the Arminius, but we may have never actually led a person to Christ. We could uh, recite the Lord's Prayer from memory, we could maybe even sing the song, but when was the last time we actually prayed the Lord's Prayer earnestly? Or even took the quiet time just to have a prayer time with God. We're teachers of God's word, we're advocates of God's word, we support God's word, but so very seldomly are we practitioners of God's word, doers of God's word. We're knowers, but not doers of God's word. And to, today we're going to look at a text where Jesus is going to talk about hearing the word of God. But not just hearing the word of God, because if you think about it, Probably, most likely, Satan knows the Bible better than us, right? The demons know the Bible better than us. Hearing the Word of God is one thing, but Jesus is going to say, that doesn't stop there. That there's actually more to it. If you just simply hear the Word of God and do nothing with it, you can become a knower of the Word of God. You'll know all this stuff, but you need to be a doer of God's Word. So, uh, I'm titling today's talk, Don't Be a Consultant, Be a Practitioner. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Father, um, I come to you as far too often a consultant of your word, a knower of your word, far too rarely am I a doer of your word, a practitioner of your word. Uh, this, your, your words as always have uh, uh, awakened me, convicted me of how often I love to talk about your word, I love to debate, I love to prove things. So often I fail to actually do the things you ask us to do or you tell us to do. Um, Lord, I'm probably not alone in this boat. And, I said today, you could uh, encourage <laughs> and passion us to be doers and practitioners of your word, that uh, we would see uh, the wonderful, good results that come from being doers of your word. Lord, I invite your Holy Spirit here as we uh, listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Luke chapter 8. I'm going to go through verses 16 through 21. I'm not going to read it just yet. We're going to go through piece by piece. Have it there. And if you look at um, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 21, uh, as you read it, there's one thing that's very apparent to you. In those verses, in those passages, Jesus is focusing in on hearing the Word of God. In fact, the word listen or hear appears nine times in just those 21 verses. He's focusing on what happens when you hear the Word of God. And to, for today, perhaps today's key verse, maybe, is verse 18, where Jesus says, Consider carefully how you listen. Consider carefully how you listen. In the previous passage uh, was the parable of the sower, or the parable of the soils. And the good soil is the soil that we want to be, is a soil that receives the word of God, retains it, and then perseveres until you, until you produce uh, abundant fruit. And so it's this hearing of the word of God. 
You know, the way we would uh, uh, define hearing the Word of God is not what Jesus is defining it as. See, back then, during Jesus' time, everyone heard the Word of God. They attended synagogue multiple times. In fact, this whole tradition, of, like right now, of me preaching to you guys, started in the synagogue where they would go and someone would read Scripture and expound on it. And after the first Christians began preaching the Gospel, they followed that same pattern of preaching the, uh, the Gospel and telling people the good news. So they, people heard the good Word. I mean, the, the Word of God all the time. People knew it back then. People had big parts of the Bible memorized. But what Jesus said is, um, like he said in a pretty earlier passage, in the same, in, I think I read the verses, I think here. Uh, can we go to the next one? Oh, yeah. uh, he quotes Isaiah 6 9 earlier in this passage. Says, Though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. People were hearing the word of God almost every day, but it was going in one ear and not the other, and it was, it was affecting those things. They weren't doing the word of God, even though they were masters of the word of God. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the scribes were experts at this, yet none of them were doing the Word of God. Um, <clears throat> so, so, for Jesus, to, to hear the Word of God, it meant you actually did the Word of God. That when you heard the Word of God, you accepted it as the very words of God, accepted it as truth, and you then respond. You, may, you have a response to the Word of God. You did something. You put it in actual practice. That's what Jesus is going towards here, is that you hear the Word of God and you need to put it into practice. So you mean we need to actually do what the Bible says? we got to do all this stuff? Yeah, we do. If you think about it, you're like, okay, well, that, that, this, this, this sounds like uh, there's strings attached to this free gift. Well, it is a free gift. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. You can follow everything the Bible says to a T and never earn your salvation. You can never, ever earn it. In fact, Jesus has already earned it for you. He's already died on the cross for your sins. He says it was finished. Your sins have been paid for. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. But how do we, know, how do we have this hope in Christ? Well, because we read the Bible. The Bible tells us this. It, it's a revelation of what happened. Jesus rose on the third day. Because he lived, because, I'm sorry, because he lives, we can also live. So we had this hope in the Word of God. But well, you know what? If we really believe that's the Word of God, then maybe if we really are willing to put our hope in, self, in, our, in our salvation in Jesus, that one day we'll be resurrected with Christ, if we're willing to put that much into the Word of God, then let's pay attention to the rest of the Bible. What does God now have to tell us? Now that we are followers of Christ, how does He want us to live? He probably has some very important things to tell us. And we shouldn't look at it as, oh, now there's strings attached. But no, rather that this God who loves us, this God who is the creator of heaven and earth, has wisdom to impart to us and has a way for us to live. And we should take it very seriously. And how many of you, if you went to work tomorrow and your boss gave you a task to do or a project or assignment, how many of you would just say, nah, I'm not going to do it? Probably wouldn't last that long. None of us would do that. I know that every one of us tomorrow, if you go to work, whatever your boss tells you to do, you're going to do it. You won't last very long if you don't. But it's so funny because here we have uh, God, the creator of heaven's earth, created you, is almighty, all powerful. The, the God who sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. And he tells you to do something. The, the, the commander in chief of the universe tells you to do something, and we're like, Nah, not gonna do it. Or oh, you know, okay, there's strings attached. We need to respond. And when we, when we become practitioners of the Word of God, Jesus tells us that the light of Christ may shine through us. Uh, let's go to the next one. We, when we're practitioners, the light of uh, Christ may shine through us. If we read in verse 16. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. Friends, we live in a very, very dark world. Many of us, we try to shield ourselves from it as much as we can, try to have a happy life with our family and friends, but sooner or later, darkness creeps in. Uh, just look at the news. If you look at the news, it can be really depressing. So especially these days, I go to CNN.com and I see another ISIS massacre in Iraq, beheadings, uh, women being raped, children being killed, uh, child molesters getting off scot-free, uh, people dying of AIDS, now people dying of Ebola. This is a very, very dark world. We can shield ourselves from that, but the fact is, this world can be very, very dark. Uh, in World War II, 
Over 60 million people died in that war. That was 2.5% of the population. 60 million people died in that war. So after World War II, after they got into Germany and saw all the concentration camps, 6 million Jews were killed, uh, devastation everywhere. The United States had dropped two nuclear bombs in Japan. Uh, just devastation. Over 60 million people had died. The world was in turmoil. And there was uh, one general, uh, don't know what country he was from, I don't even know if he's a Christian, but they, had, they were at, the, they were at the, uh, Germany after they had seen all these concentration camps, all the, uh, the dead Jews, and they asked him, is there, there's no hope in this world, is, it? is there? It's just, it was like the lowest of low of human history at one point. And the general said, you know what, I know this, that there isn't, unless Jesus Christ is real. I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said that, that without Jesus Christ there is no hope for this world. And I truly, truly believe that that when Jesus came, a light entered this world into the darkness. The darkness rejected Jesus, and that's why ultimately Jesus was crucified. But a light entered this world, and when Jesus entered this world, it was a light, and he even says, I am the light of the world. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus says he will come into our hearts, come into our souls, and make his home within us. And therefore, we will be lamps of Christ. We will shine the light of Christ in this very, very dark world. And Jesus says we are to be a lamp that's put on a stand for all to see. You know, I saw in the news the other day that almost every doctor who's gone to Africa to help with the Ebola crisis, almost all of them are Christians. Because it makes sense. If, if you aren't a Christian, why in the world would you go to Africa to die? You know, so many doctors are getting sick and dying from Ebola. And I saw that, I was like, you know what, this is something they don't put in the news. They don't like putting this stuff in the news because it's not headline. They love to put scandals and pastor scandals in the headlines, but no one puts the fact that all the doctors who are willing to sacrifice their life or put their life at risk at least to go to, uh, to Africa, most of them are Christians. I love hearing stuff like that. It just reminds me that there are Christians here who are still willing to put the Word of God in practice, who are willing to be a light in a dark place. Not, not all of us can be doctors helping you hold it because it doesn't always have to be that dramatic. But we can be a light, even into our workplace, to go there and be that one who doesn't complain about his or her job, who actually does what they're told, does it diligently, strives for excellence, shows up to work on time, uh, brings a cheerful attitude. When you, when you get backstabbed by a coworker, you forgive them rather than uh, retaliating back and forth. To be a light, to be away from people, say, you know what? There's something different about this. I love this, when this person comes to work. I just feel like our team is great when I had this person on my team. We can be lights in the work in the work. Or even at school, or even in our home, we need lights. So my question to you guys is, how's that working out for you guys? Yeah. How are you guys being light to wherever you go? Are you on, are you like a light on a stand for all to see, or are you what, like Jesus is Christ, a lamp hidden under a bowl? Maybe you're someone here who you believe that uh, your Christian faith is private, is personal. It doesn't need to be shared. You don't want to be obnoxious and put it in people's faces. It's something that should be kept in the four walls of your own home, and, and you keep it to yourself. You get this light of Christ. You have this wonderful good news, but you've covered a bowl around you, and you don't share it with anybody. In fact, maybe at your workplace, or maybe at your school, maybe with your friends, maybe they have no clue that you know Christ because you've done such a great job to hide it from them, to fit in. Maybe you're not a light for Christ because uh, you've just plain admitted to yourself that you're a hypocrite. Maybe when you're at church, when you're around your Christian friends, you uh, act a certain way, you, you speak a certain way. But when you're with your non-Christian friends, your wardrobe changes, your language changes, your morals change, your decisions change, and you think, I can't be a light to my friends. I'm just like them. I, I, how can I tell them about Christ? I'm just like them. What, I'm, I'm just adding to the darkness. Well, if, that is, if, that is, if that's you, I mean, I don't know what to say other than you need to repent. You need to repent of this, because that's not doing the word of God. Jesus, we are to be a light to the world. Not the obnoxious way in your face, making people everywhere get annoyed with you, but if people need to know that you know Christ. People need to say, why is it that uh, when, when I uh, do something, I say something rude to Joe, he just takes it and he doesn't retaliate. Why is it that when uh, so-and-so... Uh, uh, something happens, disappointing happens, they don't get the raise that they want, they're not going around complaining. Why is it that when someone else is having a hard time, that person takes the time to talk to them and li actually listen to what they're saying and try to hear them and understand where they're coming from? Why, why, why do well, we need to see these things? We can be a light in, in that way. 
And I'm telling you all this not because I want you guys to feel guilty about not being a light in the world. Like, oh man, I'm such a bad Christian. Uh, I, you know, I'm afraid to say grace in public places because I'm worried about the ridicule. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. You know, I'm here to think, like encourage you, excite you that we have this wonderful light inside of us. And we can share. This is a very dark world. People need Christ. I know you think, oh, maybe they don't. Because you're looking at maybe your own life. But this is a dark world. People are dying. People need Christ. Marriages are falling apart. People are addicted to sin. People are addicted to drugs. A lot of times you don't even know that they are. People need to know the light of Christ. And we are the vessel that God has chosen to bring the light to the darkness. To bring the light to the workplace. He's chosen us. Us sinners, yes. But he's chosen us. You know, we're not going to be perfect. And we can go to our friends and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I am a hypocrite sometimes because I'm a sinner. And the only one, but you know what? The only one who's never been a hypocrite is Jesus Christ. And he's the one that I worship. And you know what? Ever since I've known Christ, I've become better and better and less and less of a hypocrite. I'm striving to that. I'll admit to you, though, that I have my dark days. I'll have my road rage. I'll have my moments of anger. But I'm getting better because of Christ. And Christ, I looked at Christ. He was a man who was not a hypocrite. You read the Gospels, through and through was the most amazing man who ever lived. Who's the most amazing man you guys ever known living right now? Would you say? I don't know. Who would it be? Uh, I don't know. The DeSecchi's guy or the uh, Putin, uh, Putin uh, Obama, uh, maybe like Brad Pitt. I don't know. There's many interesting guys. None of them come even close to the person of Jesus Christ and the amazingness about this person. He was a man who who just had no hypocrisy and had no sin in him. And such an interesting man for us to get to know. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Be encouraged that we, are, we have this light and we can share this light and it should not be kept under a ball. Another reason why we should be practitioners of God's word is, uh, let me go to the next slide here, uh, is this so that our faith becomes more real. Let's look at the next uh, verse. Also, okay, actually, before we go to that, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus said that, uh, uh, you know, in John chapter 8, that if you hold to my teaching, uh, can we go back to this? If you hold to my teaching, uh, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, at one point in our lives, we will hear the gospel, we will hear it preached, and we'll accept it as truth. We'll accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit will come in and convict us this is truth, this is wisdom, and power from God. But as time goes by, we start realizing that there's a lot of people in this world who also have truth claims. Other religions who say, I have the truth, you guys are wrong, we are right. The Hindus are right, the Christians are wrong. The atheists are right, religion is wrong. Muslims are right, Christianity is wrong. All these people have, are speaking into our lives, telling us that our, we have the truth, you don't. And we say, we have the truth, you don't. And at some point in our lives, it gets to a point where we start to have doubt. We're like, whoa. There are a lot of people out there who claim to have the truth. And sometimes it's really hard to navigate who really has the truth. What do we do? Well, we can just like give up and be apathetic or be agnostic. Or we can... Um, I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, my, my, my mind just went blank, sorry. Um, you hurt your son. What's that? You probably hurt your son. Oh, no, no. Um, well, well, I'll just, uh, so, okay, so, we uh, hear all these different truths, at some point we just get confused, and I think that Jesus did not get totally uh, all caught off guard by the fact that Christians one day would struggle with finding the truth. You know, at first we hear the truth that convicts us, but he knew that one day we'd be challenged in our faith, that there would be other people speaking to us and trying to challenge us uh, in what we believe. And so he says, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That if you do what Jesus tells you to do, you actually obey his commands, that you will see that it's actually true, that when you actually love your enemy, that something really good comes from that. That actually when you forgive someone, that this, this feeling of peace can come from you, that you don't have to live in constant anger and retaliation. If you look in the Middle East right now, and, and you see all you see is the absence of forgiveness. 
You know, Israel, Hamas, they're, they're practicing eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, missile for a missile. That's lack of forgiveness. Jesus says, if you follow my teaching, you'll be convicted more and more that your faith is real. It is the truth. That God will reveal more and more of himself to you. And in the verses we read today, we'll go to the next uh, slide. It's where there's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. And nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will, they have will be taken from them. Jesus says, when you practice um, the, the word of God, the secrets of the kingdom will be revealed to you. That's what he's talking about here, about nothing will be hidden, nothing will be disclosed. And what he's talking about is not some weird ethereal thing about some weird mysteries of God, but that Jesus, if you think of it, is a mystery. Not a mystery that we can't know him, but a mystery that is he's so amazing, so interesting, but also he was more than just a man. When he, Jesus came, the kingdom of God came into this world. He was God in the flesh. And that for us is very hard to understand. And sometimes we think, okay, that doesn't make sense. How does that all work? And as we do the word of God, as we obey Jesus' teaching, we realize more and more, only God could have spoken what Jesus has spoken. That truly was the, the Son of God. And we become convicted more and more of that. For Jesus, if you actually heard the word of God, you would put it into practice. <clears throat> The third thing that uh, Jesus says to be a practitioner of God is because that is how we become part of Jesus' family. Let's read the next verses here. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Now think about this. For most of us, we, uh, our families are very important to us. We love our families. We're very loyal to our families. Uh, we love them. So much was the case during Jesus' time. Family was very important. You were very loyal to your family. You rarely disobeyed them. And so when Jesus' mother and brothers showed up uh, to see Jesus and they couldn't get in because there's too many people and they couldn't see Jesus, when they told Jesus that they were out there, we would have totally understood. They would have totally understood. If Jesus, hey guys, uh, I need to take this. I need to go and see them. I know my family has probably traveled very far. I haven't seen them in forever. Uh, Hold that thought, I'll come back. But instead, Jesus gives a verbal slap to the face to his mother and brothers and says, I'm already with my family. Whoever does the word of God and puts in practice, they're my family. I'm doing just fine. And he doesn't even bother going out to see them. I mean, it seems very rude of what Jesus is doing here. And what Jesus is doing here is not to say that family is not important compared to the ministry of God. The ministry of God is the only thing that's important and we should ignore it. See, some pastors have taught, have gone that route and believe all I got to do is put all my efforts, energy, and time, and love into my church and ignore my family and neglect them. There's thousands of pastor families that are now struggling because a pastor has told himself that he needs to have his ambition to make his church great has neglected his family. That's not what Jesus is saying here at all. In fact, Jesus loved his family, loved his mother very much. In fact, when Jesus is dying on the cross, he takes the time to tell John to take care of his mother after he dies. After Jesus resurrects from the dead, he personally, uh, pers uh, personally appears to his brother James. He loved his family very much. But what, what he was saying is as much as he loved his family, that nothing was more important than the word of God and obeying it. That might sound blasphemy to many of you. That the word of God, that God can be more important than the love of your parents, than spending time with your parents. See, so this goes along the same route of when Jesus uh, didn't condemn Mary and Bethany. See, uh, when Mary and Martha, Jesus came to Mary and Martha's house, and Martha was cooking up a big meal, doing all this work, and Mary was just sitting there at Jesus' feet, listening, not even paying attention to all the, all the work that Martha was doing. And Martha got angry at Mary for not helping her. But Jesus tells uh, Martha, Martha, Mary is doing what is right. Mary, as important it was to prepare a meal and help out, was just enraptured with Jesus and was sitting at his feet. And at that moment, the most important thing she could be doing is just taking Jesus' words in and accepting it. And so what Jesus is saying is our families are very, very important. But if they were so important that they trumped the word of God, that, they, that family always came first before God, then what's the good news? If, if family was the, was the most important thing, why should we uh, care so much about uh, God? Why should we pay attention to it? Because family would be the most important thing. If we really had the best news we could ever hear, if God is really that great, if we should really know God, 
He should be far more important than our family bonds. Much more important. This is the, if he really is the creator of the universe, then he created your parents who love you. He created love himself. Love and all those things that we could possibly enjoy, God created. And he's saying that obeying God is your first and foremost priority, even above your family bond. This is hard for a lot of people because there are going to be times where obeying the word of God, putting it into practice, is going to put you at odds. It's going to cause you to hurt your family. If you come from a Buddhist family, or a Hindu family, or even a, a Muslim family, you will hurt your parents a lot if you convert to Christianity, if you begin obeying uh, the words of Christ. I don't know if Harrison might be telling the story, but he said that when he told his Buddhist grandmother that he had converted to Christianity, she slapped him in the face, just was so angry. You know, that, that's what it's like to, 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 to uh, sometimes obey the word of God, is you're going to have to uh, basically verbally or metaphorically slap your parents in the face, or your family in the face, and do something that may, may, may seem like you're actually hating them not doing what's most loving for them. But what Jesus again says is if you put these words into practice, you will be a light in this world. You will be a light to your family. In fact, the most loving thing you could ever do is to put the words of Christ into practice. Because you know what? It's going to make you a better family member. It's going to make you a better, more loving family member. They're going to be angry at you for changing your religion and disgracing that way or maybe they'll consider it as a disrespect. But you will love your parents more. You'll be praying for your parents more. When they're in trouble, you're going to be more likely to help them. You're going to be less selfish. You're going to be more willing to forgive them. And in time, you would hope that eventually they would realize that you are changed and that Christ has made a difference in your life. That's the most best thing you could do. That sounds like a lot of bad grammar. The best thing you could do for your family is obeying the word of Christ, even if it means disobeying them. I do believe that one day we will be part of God's family. I, I, I don't know how what heaven will exactly be like. I actually think heaven will probably be on this earth, renewed. Sin will be vanquished. Darkness will be vanquished. And we will all be part of God's family. God is the creator of family. I see how God has created a man and a woman to love each other, to understand the love of God. How he created us to have, have children, um, to procreate, to have our love for our children, to see them rebel, even though we love them, to learn about our relationship with God. He created family to teach us so much. Family, I think, will always exist. And if God created such a beautiful bond as family, because I love my children, I love my wife, I love my family, if God created that, I'm pretty sure that one day when we spend eternity with heaven, the family that God creates us will be even better. We'll be without sin. We'll spend eternity in this loving family. Jesus will be our brother. He'll call you his brother. He'll call you his sister. Be part of God's family. We'll be so sweet. It's so cherished, and I look forward to that. And when we put the words of God into practice, Jesus says, you are my brother, you are my sister. Now, to bring this to a close, uh, how do we be practitioners of God's word? And what I like to do, every time I hear a sermon or a Bible study, I love asking the question, so what? So what? Okay, you just told me about the Trinity, or you just told me about what God is like, so what? Does it make any difference in my life? And I have to go to work tomorrow, I work all day, how does the world... How, what, what do I do about this, what you just told me? So I like to ask the question, so what? And if you're sitting here today, one way to be a practitioner of God's word is when you hear a sermon, you've heard probably hundreds, if not thousands, thousands of sermons in your life, is I always ask you, so what? God, how can I be a practitioner of your word? When you hear a sermon, do away with the thought of how much you respect the person who's preaching that day. Get rid of your prejudice. Maybe, maybe, the, 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 maybe the, the speaker that day won't be, isn't get very gifted at speaking. But tell yourself, God, I'm coming here today to hear your words, because the word of God is being spoken today. God, help me to, to, to know what your word is. Let me hear your word, and then, and then do what you say. Be a doer of your word. And, and pray for the one who's preaching. Pray that you'll hear from them. The person who's speaking will, can speak clearly. And then say, God, I want to do the word of God. You know, I, most of the times when I hear sermons, two days later, I already forgot what the sermon was about. You know, we're like that. We're human beings. We forget. So I've heard probably almost a thousand sermons in my life. I can only recall a few. You know, we forget. But every time we hear someone, we need to ask ourselves a question. How, God, do you want me to live? How can I put this word of God into practice and do it? And Jesus promises that we will become light in this dark world. That, we'll, that our faith will become more real. 
And Jesus will call us our brothers and sisters if we put God's word into practice. Let me close with a video. Uh, this is from uh, Francis Chan. Uh, he's a pastor in California. And he just puts it in a good light about uh, what it means to hear God's word and what it means to not to hear God's word. So uh, if you want to turn the volume up there. Why does that work in church and not anywhere else? Look, when, when, when my daughter comes to me and I say, hey, go, go clean your room. She knows better. She, she's not going to come back a couple hours later and say, hey, Dad, I memorized what you said to me. You said, go clean your room. You know, what am I going to say? Oh, good job. That's what I wanted. No. And she's not going to come to me and say, Dad, I can say, go clean your room in Greek. Listen, that's not going to fly. And you know, what if she says, you know what? My friends and I, we're going to gather together and every week we're going to have a study and we're going to figure out what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> no, none of that's going to fly. Just go and clean it. She knows that. So why do we think that this type of thinking or this type of talk is going to work with Jesus? I mean, Jesus was as black and white as you get. He would look at people and he'd say, why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I say? He says that in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I ask you to do? Why would you call someone your master and then not listen to him? And, and he says in Matthew 7, 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's only the one who actually does the will of my Father who is in heaven.